Hello, everybody. Thank you for stopping by. This is awesome. This is the Outstanding Life Show. My name is Jason. I am Hala Sober. And welcome to the pre show. Today, I sent out a message to everybody. I was pretty excited. One of my friends posted a message about their celebratory message. You know, when they get to the milestones, it's a big thing in recovery related to milestones. Uh, every every day is a celebration. Every day is a, a huge win. And so when I got to help celebrate one of my friend's milestones, it was huge. And I was like, you know what? Way to go. Good for you. That's awesome. And then I began to wonder where, you know, what, what birthday am I at? And so I went and I asked Siri because Siri knows everything. And Siri told me I am. Oh, wait, hold on. You can't really see. I just noticed. Let me remove the lower third. There we go. Okay. So I am sitting at 2,110 days. Oh man, this is actually really cool. I'm pretty excited. You know, like 2,110 days ago, my life looked completely different. I wasn't anywhere near as resilient as I am today. Like this, the, the today's topic, Today we're going to chat about resilience and I wanted to find a topic that would be good and relatable and that people can connect with and I thought, you know what, a birthday celebration would be pretty easy. It's kind of a, kind of a good win. So today I'm celebrating 2,110 days. I'm pretty pumped about that. It's not a, I don't want to say it's not a small birthday because it is. It's over five and a half years. In a couple months it'll be six years six years like who I was then is not the same person as I am now so I'm really thankful I'm really pumped there's been a lot of support I've received along the way there's a lot of patience people were, were given me earlier in my struggle and my daily my daily grind and now I'm at a position where I can offer assistance to others like I can help those who need that extra little bit of a nudge one of the hardest things for me was in the beginning, I was sharing this in a, in a previous stream with another group of friends. And then I was sharing that with recovery. One of the hardest things I had to kind of identify with is this idea of, you know, what, what, who was I going to become? after I make this decision, like if I remove alcohol and substance abuse from my life, who am I going to, what, you know, what shell of a person is going to be left over? What's going to be left after the wake of destruction? I, I imagined it being some sort of a wake of destruction. It really wasn't. But in my mind, I built it up to being that. In my mind, I had thought, you know what? I am not going to survive this. Like the friends I had made, the life I had built, the, the lifestyle I was living, I wasn't a very healthy lifestyle and I wasn't very supportive or resilient. That's today's topic is resilience. So it was hard enough for me to want to believe in that myself. And that fear, like it was, I don't want to say it wasn't the decision that made me stop. It was the fear of what was I going to be afterwards? Like I had the doubt in myself that I couldn't achieve these things. And the amount of work that would be involved in making that happen seemed insurmountable like starting a life over again you know who am i going to be left with with friends who's going to want to go and hang out who's going to want to go to the movies or go to a dinner you know these are things that socially i had built up to being like big things that had mattered a lot to me then and at that time in my life i had different values i had different different focuses um I didn't have a healthy mindset. I didn't have healthy friendships. I didn't have a healthy lifestyle. I wasn't living the best way I could. And part of that I would attribute to this idea I had in my head about not being able to achieve these ideas I had about not being able to accomplish. And when I don't want to say when someone doesn't have that, just give it to them. Because you can't just tell somebody, oh, don't worry, you can just stop. Don't worry, you can just cut these out and you'll be fine. But the hard part with that is 
it can't be something as dismissive or, or as uh, all-encompassing because you can't paint everyone with the same broad brush. Everybody deals with their struggles individually. The same struggle for me is not the same struggle for you. The same challenges for me is not the same challenges for you, but there's still challenges. There's still struggles and how we manage them is individual as well. There's healthy ways to manage it and then there's other ways to manage it. The whole point of this show, the whole point is to help engage others, start conversations, have healthy discussions, have, have, have that, I don't want to say that staple. I don't want to say this show is meant for those who haven't made the decision. No, I've, I made this a show so that we have a place where we can talk. For those who have made the decision already that they want to live this outstanding life, that they want to move forward with this decision. Earlier, I'd shared a story about how I was afraid before making the decision. But once I did, I didn't realize that there was such a wave of support. There's such an ocean of information. There's way more caring. There's compassion. There's way more emotion out there than just barely getting by. You know, in the heat of my recovery, you know, in the, sorry, in the heat of my addiction, I only had like two mindsets. I had one, which was a mindset of lack and that ruled everything that made decisions for me that made you know what i was going to do that day and then things were either really really good or they were really really bad and the dis if things were really good you know if you have a healthy mindset you're going to be okay but if things are really good and you've got a negative mindset if you're making poor life decisions if i'm making the wrong parts of me make decisions that i shouldn't be empowering if I'm giving them more weight and more thought, pretty soon one thing leads to another. And in a previous episode, we talked about the matchstick, throwing it in the garbage bin. And if you throw the matchstick in the garbage bin, the garbage bin will catch fire. And if you don't deal with it and you throw that garbage bin in a larger can, like a, like a garbage bin outside, now it's gonna catch fire. And if you don't deal with that, then the, the whole house catches fire or the building next to it catches fire. So, if left unchecked, unhealthy thoughts can lead to very poor decisions. And so here is where making poor decisions, it can't just be, um, I don't want to say it's just a habit. It's not something you can just cure overnight. It's not something you can just make go away. It's something that takes time to exercise. You have to, I had to, focusing on my aspect and my recovery, I never had this belief in my mind that I could do these things and I had believed that I would never deserve nice things. Not like nice jeans or nice clothes, but I didn't believe I deserved a, a good solid relationship. I didn't believe that I could have, um, you know, go out and get my driver's license or my learners. You know, I didn't think I could ever own a place one day. You know, these are things that I had believed would limit me before I even started. Very similar to the thought of who is I going to become after I make the decision to give up alcohol and drugs and substance abuse. And if I let these fears make decisions, I'm never going to get to that outstanding life. If I live in that fear and that doubt, I'm never going to be open to the idea of something bigger, better and brighter. But the challenge then becomes, how do you create that feeling in others? How do you help connect that in others? You know, if someone doesn't have that natural language built into them, you know, you can't share those things and just have them openly accepted if they're not open, willing, or ready. Admittedly, I was not in a spot where I was open, willing, or ready. I was not in a spot, you know, I think in, the, in one of the previous episodes I shared about, what was it, the, the movie that I watched with Denzel Washington with Flight, where he flies the plane upside down, and there's a spot in the movie where when I saw that, you know, Denzel, if he can go to an AA meeting and if he can be in a meeting and they're having fun and laughing, I was like, holy cow, if Denzel can do this, I can do this. That was 2,110 days ago. And, you know, it sounds silly. It sounds like I'm not reducing my recovery down to that aspect. But what I'm saying is, you know, had I had I thought things through in an empowering way, had I thought things through in a much more supportive way, you know, I, I didn't need to panic. 
I made it way bigger of an issue than I needed to. Hold on, that's way bigger than I thought. Let's let's shrink that down. Let's move that over. We'll put it over on the corner. There we go. There. So I didn't need to make it a big issue more than I needed to. And I think I let it make decisions way more. And I let that take a lot of control away from me. And because of that, I wasn't in a spot to allow recovery into my life. I wasn't in a spot allowing myself to grow. And this is where I'm kind of leading this into because the question of the day that I was asking everybody was, you know, what is resilience to you? And when it comes to like an event crisis standpoint, like when, when we're given no other options but to grow, when we're given no other choice but to succeed, when we have no other like window of opportunity other than to make it through, when we're in that event crisis point, when we have no other choice but to make it through the other side, we have a choice where we can, you know, if we're going to make it through it, we're going to need to grow. And to grow, we have to be malle malleable. We have to be able to go and shift ourselves, shift our beliefs, stretch ourselves to be able to fit that crisis, to fit that what's needed. And in order to make that happen, it can't just be something where we, we aimlessly throw ourselves into that crisis of endpoint and we'll just somehow make it through. No. In order to make it through, you're going to have to actually grow. You're going to need to grow and expand yourself, expand your world to a third dimension to be able to push yourself through it. That is growth. Everybody makes it through those event crisis points. Well, well hopefully everybody makes it through. You grow. So when you're put in the moment, you will grow. Otherwise, you'll not make it through that moment, that event crisis point. When it comes to resilience, resilience is something that you have before you even get to that event crisis point. Resilience is something where you've got that innate energy already in you. You've got that knowing, you've got that certainty, you have that compassion for yourself. Not, I don't want to say that arrogance where you're going to believe in yourself so much, you're going to make it through it, but you've had the practice, you've had the preparedness, and you've been able to believe in that process. You believe in yourself to the point where I know I can do this. I believe I can make it through this. So that when we're presented with those event crisis points, that resilience carries with you. And when you have that resilience, your whole world can change. Everybody has to grow in those moments, those event crisis points. Growth comes and growth goes. You can be thrown into a difficult situation. You can stub your toe. The bank bounces your check. You lose your car keys. You know, those are menial things. You're going to grow through those situations. But it's when you have the preparedness, when you've got the resilience with you. My friend Barbara, she says it best. I love, I love, she's the one that gave that example about the resilience of what you have before you even get to that point. And what Barbara says really stuck with me. Because then I began to picture myself, because her show is on family resilience like the ability of a family dynamic, being able to, to go through that recovery, to get through that addiction, to get through that dynamic of alcoholism or substance abuse, like being able to shift through that in a growth moment, everybody grows. But like, does everybody have that resilience? The resilience to be able to see through and that event crisis point to believe in something more than yourself to believe in something bigger than you something bigger than me and have the belief that you're going to make it through it not this like aimlessly a blind faith i believe i'm going to make it through it that falls into the growth category growth is okay growth will get you through the moment but the next time a situation arises are you prepared you know maybe it takes a series of growth moments before we start stretching ourselves to then I don't want to say maintain that resilience, but to allow that resilience to fold into our daily life, to fold into what we're prepared for, to fold into this next level of a, an outstanding life. Hold on. I want to bring this back. Okay. So if you're new here, if this is the first time you're hanging out with me, my name is Jason. This is the Outstanding Life Show. We talk about everything related to recovery. We talk about overcoming addiction. Again, this show isn't meant to be there where 
trying to force someone to make a decision or trying to convince you to make a decision. No, this is meant to be a companion for those who have already made the decision that this is a life they want to live, that this is something they want to pursue. And, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't, was last week I sat down and I counted all the episodes. We're up to like 15 now or 14. This is huge. I never thought, you know, I've been going live every weekend and I, we've covered what did we, we hit? We covered Rock Bottom. That was a big one. That's my number one watched episode. Uh, we talked about stressors. We talked about uh, community. We talked about triggers. Triggers is another big one. A lot of people like the trigger episode. Um, we also talked about the 12 steps. And we there's so many different things we've gone over. Um, habits, good habits. Being able to help identify the things we can watch out for. And we've kind of gone through the whole gamut. And now we've gotten to the part where we're talking about resilience. And I wanted to share, well, before I go on, hold on. So if you like what we're doing here, if you like what we're talking about and you want to get more information, feel free to type show in the comments and then I'll send a reminder out the next time we go live. And again, we go live every weekend um, around 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. I do send, uh, shend, oh my God. We, I do send a message in advance. Just let everybody know, hey, we're going live in about 10 minutes. If you want to come join the conversation, feel free to do so. Um, I do send like a little image and something fun to go along with it. Hold on, I'm going to bring it up. I want to show you. So this guy, take a look at him. This is me in Vegas. I sent this picture with the message, so the reminder to go live. Check this out. This is one of the rare moments where I'm wearing a hat. I saw this in Vegas and, I, and it just looked amazing. I didn't think I would ever be able to go to Vegas as someone who no longer partakes in, in, in alcohol. But there's so many fun things in life to experience. Vegas happens to be one of them, but there's way more out there than these limiting beliefs. That was another episode. If you want to go check out more, go ahead and watch. Go check them out. Okay, so enough about my hat in Vegas. Okay. Right. So, I wanted to bring up one more thing here. Okay, so what is a crisis? So, from a crisis standpoint, we have a crisis is any event that is or expected to lead to an unstable and dangerous situation affecting an individual group or community or a whole society. You know, crises are deemed to be negative, negative changes in the security, economic, political, societal, environmental affairs, especially when they occur abruptly with little or no warning, more loosely, it is a term meaning a testing time or an emergency event. Okay, so now that we have the definition of a crisis, from a normal person standpoint, I almost said the word normie and just a side comment. I, in the last episode, I said the word normie and I made a joke that to, and I said, you know, to a normie, this wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't make any difference. And then I got a message from somebody who watches the show and they told me they'd watched a, a show before and they didn't get the normie reference. And like, what does normie mean? By the way, I love your show. And I laughed and I laughed because I thought, you know what? I didn't explain it. So a normal person wouldn't be impacted by the same impacts, uh, the same things that would impact someone who's on, who's in the struggle, who's in addiction, who's suffering, who's letting themselves being run rampant. So looking at it here, okay, is it here? No, it's this, this one, okay, there we go. So if I'm looking here, so what a crisis is, is any event that is expected to or leads to an unstable or a dangerous situation. So if we take that for just a minute. So a normal person, a normie, who is impacted by a crisis, it'd be something that is unstable for them, something that is a dangerous situation that's affecting them or a group or community. And so, if a normal person is impacted negatively, that would be considered a crisis event, like those crisis events that take place. And 
I don't want to say if you lower that down, but if you were to take somebody who already is in an unstable position, who is in an unstable mindset, who is already in that, I want to say, where we talked about where earlier I mentioned I had like two emotions. I had the things are really, really bad. Or thing, things are never really that good. And then things are always way too good. And then it wouldn't matter which situation I'm in. It doesn't matter the mindset. I'm going to be making poor decisions when things are really good or when things are really bad. They always say uh, if you go to, when you go to meetings, like AA meetings, there's a spot where they say, you know, if things are really good, go to a meeting. If things are really bad, go to a meeting. And there's more truth in that than in the beginning, I didn't realize how important that was. Because when things are good, you want to go out and celebrate. You want to go do things that are amazing. When things are bad, you want to go and complain and you want to go and mope and you want to like sulk. And that's not a real healthy way to deal with things. Neither is going out and celebrating every three and a half minutes. Again, to somebody that's a normal person, they don't go and look for reasons to drink or to consume. And people who are struggling, like addicts and alcoholics, we will use them as excuses to go and do these things. I'm not saying that we take mountains out of molehills. What I'm saying though is that there's different crisis event points depending on the level, like how, how degraded that substance abuse has become or how much alcoholism has taken over our life. A normal person won't be impacted as much as saying someone who has a destabilized sense of moral compass. And so when, when we don't have that growth opportunity, when you know, it was very, very hard when I was in, I went to the treatment center and when I was in rehab and they had shared, okay, so when you go to these, I was there with like 50 other guys, like five zero. And when I was there, they're like, okay, so when you come back, so you, Jason, like when you come back a year from now, so like a whole year from now, though look to your left and look to your right. Only one of those two guys will be there. And I was like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, no, isn't everybody going to be back here? Cause we're all here, right? All of all 50 of us, we're all going to come back. We're all going to come back, right? All of us will. And they're like, no, actually out of the 50 guys, only two of you will make it. And I was like, no, I know all these guys. I can list all their names, where they're from, how they got here and where they want to go. You know, I've got to know everyone. And they're like, no, it's, it's, it's a reality you're gonna have to get used to. Sure enough, I came back a year later and there was two guys there, two. And it, it makes it real. Like there's, not everybody has that same sense of resilience. Not everyone has been given that same opportunity to grow. Not everyone has that same level of compassion for themselves and for others. And I truly believe that if given the opportunity, people will, if given the opportunity to do amazing things, they will. And the last thing I want, the last thing anyone wants is to be held back by these limiting beliefs. The last thing anyone wants is to be living in the shell of a person. I was this hollow, empty person for many years of my life. I'm thankful that I'm here and I'm thankful by the, the higher power that I've been given the ability where I can impact others and help others that I'm you know, what these big crisis events that I had when I was younger, 2,110 days ago, aren't the same kind of crisis I, I face today. I still have event crisis points, but I don't let them make decisions for me. You know, I no longer, you know, I no longer panic. I no longer, I can, I can identify where things are coming from. I can see where they're moving to, and I can help develop a plan to move forward. And here's a, I want to show you guys another thing here. Okay. So this one shows. Awesome. So this one shows the event crisis management. Okay. So this one is going and saying, this is just something I grabbed, uh, but I was relating to like planning, right? So I just mentioned about, I can see something, I can identify it as a crisis point. Here I am 2,110 days later, and I've got somewhat of a plan. It may not always work, but I can refine it and I can move forward with it. 
Okay, so let's let's check it out. So crisis management, step one. Pre-planning, okay, pre-planning and crisis prevention. You know, if you were to talk to me before my life of recovery, I wouldn't even have step one. I would just be jumping into step two right away, managing at a critical mass. I would wait till things build up so much that eventually it becomes unbearable. My life had become unbearable. It had become unmanageable. And so getting to that stage now where I can identify an issue, when a habit becomes a problem, and I can start moving forward to crisis prevention. What can I do to help mitigate this? You know, if I can't stop it, maybe I can mitigate it. What can I do the next time to help move forward in a much more positive light? Then we actually move into the managing at the critical mass point. So like when, when everything is thick, when it's go time, when there's no other option but to succeed, like Eminem in his eight mile story, we've got no other choice but to go up. But that's the benefit of being down. And then we've got step three, reincorporating lessons that are learned. So after every challenging point in my life, now, now that I'm 2,110 days older, I've got to the point where, okay, what worked and what didn't work? What were successes? What were some quick wins? What are some things I learned that I could have done better? You know, there are some meetings I have to go to at work where we, after challenging meetings, we sit down, we have a powwow and we're like, okay, so what worked, what didn't work? What feedback do you have for me? I wouldn't have been able to do that 2,110 days ago. I wouldn't even be in that position if I wasn't willing to be open to feedback, much less embrace it. Part of the cycle, that circle of life, is including feedback. Part of that circle of growth includes the crisis event point, but it also includes growing and learning from it. And, and I want to say believing that there's a positive outcome. It doesn't sound right. Like if I believe that there is a successful outcome in the future that exists, you know, I may not understand what it is right now, but I can believe that it's there. And then in just the belief that it's there, I recognize that there's a limit to my knowledge and the recognition of the limits of my knowledge help create the foundation that allows me to then embrace something beyond, beyond that limit. So I begin to ask questions like, you know, if I was wrong, how would I be wrong? And if I were wrong, what are some things I can do to help exercise that? You know, what, you know, what muscles can I flex to help make it so it's not an issue later? If that was the issue, maybe I'm the issue. Maybe my problems are the one that are causing the issues. Maybe it's got nothing to do with other people. It's, you know, I began to start opening up to the world of maybe it's not them. Maybe it's actually circling back to me. Maybe there's some ownership. Maybe I can keep my side of the street clean here. And by doing so, that allows me that flexibility to live a life that's that's outstanding. Like it allows me to grow beyond what I can, what I see as my experiences. If all I ever do is look around and I see, I think in the, one of the past episodes, I talked about living in a world where, like imagine you're living in 360 degrees of mirrors. And if what we look at is just seeing things in other people that we can identify as separate or different we're looking at ways of disqualifying or discrediting or separating ourselves from them or he's doing this or they're doing that or they're just doing this to get to me or like i become consumed with all these thoughts that are not helpful they're not supportive they're not conducive to this outstanding life i want to live but instead, if I were to look at that same 360 degrees of mirrors, because it's the same ocean of information that exists inside of us, that exists outside of us. That was Deepak Chopper. So if it's the same ocean that exists inside as it is outside, then it's what we choose to recognize in other people that we help identify in ourselves. I'm not saying that you don't credit anything that's not good. But if I'm looking for aspects of myself and others, if I'm looking at that, I can relate to somebody because of this, we do this thing specifically that I've been able to identify this together. I start bridging that connectivity more than I look at ways of disrupting or discrediting or separating myself. When I start separating myself, I'm letting parts of myself make decisions that I shouldn't. If I start discrediting and removing that, I'm not relating. If I'm not relating, I'm not relatable. 
And if I'm not relatable, well, you can't really develop a solid foundation with someone if you can't relate to them, right? So here's where, you know, I've had 2,110 days of hard lessons. The hardest ones were at the beginning. The hardest ones I needed the most help and the most patience. At the beginning, I shared a lot of people were patient with me. Now I'm given the ability where I can help be patient with other people. Now I can help encourage other people to grow and I can help others by opening the language, like opening up the can of worms of this show to start talking and communicating. Every week I get messages from people who watch the show. It's amazing. I know there's people that comment. I just realized there's comments. Hold on. I gotta go check out the comments, but just finish this thought. There's times where I wanted to, I wasn't sure if I should talk about this or that. And then sure enough, I get a message from somebody that says, yes, thank you for talking about that. And I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Okay, so let me go back. And we do have comments. Yes, we do. We have Barbara. Hello, Barbara. Thank you for stopping by. Thanks for hanging out. Is it warm there too in, in Manitoba? Is, you get the hot streaks. It's supposed to be hot the next week. Do you have rain? It's cold here. And Matthew, Maddie, how you doing, Maddie? Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for hanging out. I really appreciate that. And then Barbara says, I love the tattoo, the finger tattoo, Hope, yes. Did I not show you what they are? Hold on, okay. So, okay, I'm gonna get the light. Okay, so this one goes, can you see it? Yeah. Hold on, it says have hope, have hope, and then check it out, huh? Stay calm, yes. So I got have hope and stay calm. Can you think, like, it was so much fun. It, it actually really hurt. Do you know, fun fact, do you know what one hurt the most? It was actually the ring finger. Because when they did the ring finger, the ring finger, it, by the, by the time they finished doing that ring finger, by the time I got over the pain of the ring finger, he had actually finished the whole rest of the hand. And, and so when they say there's more nerves in the ring finger, they're not lying. They're actually true. I thought it was all brouhaha until I got the finger tattoo. You know, it's all fun and games until someone gets a finger tattoo, right? Anyway, okay. So there's more comments. There's one more. And it's Lisa. Hello, Lisa. Thank you for hanging out, stopping by. Miss you ever so much. Things are not things are things are not the same, but we miss you. I hear you're doing good things. You're doing awesome work. I hear nothing but positive, amazing stuff. Thank you, Lisa, for stopping by. Okay. And then Barbara. Barbara's sharing she loves it. Yes, Barbara. Thank you. I know. These things. I remember. This is it. It was at the beginning when I got these done, when I had made the decision that I didn't want to, that I didn't want to live that life anymore. And I was like, well, how am I going to remember? Well, I knew how I can remember. Like I knew I could just tell myself, you should just cheer up. You should just do these things. Listen to your Tony Robbins tapes. You'll be fine. You can't just tell people to do that. So then I was like, I know what I'll do. I'll get these tattoos because these people and I was telling the guy at the tattoo place, you know what I want? I want to get this. And he's like, what? You want to get, sure, okay, I'll do it. And then so I got those. And then a couple of years later, actually, I went and I got another one. It was on my back. It was in Hawaii. Because I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll go celebrate. And I think it was my two year, my two years of sobriety that I decided Yes, because it was my first year of sobriety. I got the laser eye surgery. Amazing, by the way. LASIK. Anybody? Try it out. And then on my second year, I decided I was going to get a back tattoo. And then this I got early on at the beginning. Beginning beam. And still, I never regret it. I love it. And now here I am. I'm coming out in October. It's going to be six years. Six. That's only like a month, two months. I can't believe it. We're gonna go every month at the treatment center. They have a birthday party and they have cake. And then there's like all the guys are there. 
and it's everybody who has a birthday in that month. We all get together and it's a, and it's amazing because they have all the newcomers there. So the newest people in the program, they're there, they show up and they're the ones greeting you at the door. And then the rest of the time, it's all the people that have graduated the program over the years in that month, they come back. And then that for me was the big thing. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm coming to the birthday party. I'm going to be all 50 guys are there. No, not all 50 show up. Not all 50 make it sadly, but still the idea of celebrating with people, the idea of taking those small wins and you know, part, part of the recovery process is to not look forward. Well, I don't say not look forward to the future. It's more of don't live in the future to the point where you're not present today. So I'm very much present today. I do very much take advantage of every opportunity I have to grow, to be more, to live. And tomorrow, tomorrow will be day 2,111 and it'll be a good day. You know, every day is a good day. You know, every day I'm not gonna, hold on, I'm not gonna panic. Uh, I'm gonna have fun. There's me with the hat. I go to Vegas. I never thought I'd go to Vegas and enjoy time and celebrate, but I made sure I went with a supportive community. I went with my good friend and I made it an adventure. You know, I, I let someone into my life from a, from a relationship standpoint. Um, I got to the point where that no longer suited my life. That no longer added value. I have standards where I'll let people into my life and I have standards where I no longer let people in my life. I'm thankful I've been blessed with this opportunity to share and grow. I have a lot of fun hanging out with everybody, making this weekly show, but yeah, it, it, it's so rewarding for me to know that I can count on this show being here every week. I'm trying to think of the next steps, the next things I want to do. We're doing this live event every day in this video community I'm a part of. And a year ago is when I first started it. And here I am a year later and I've got this show going every week for like 15 weeks. If you told me a year ago, I wouldn't have been able to believe this. If you were to tell me 2,110 days ago, I'd be here. I wouldn't believe you, but it's having that resilience to believe in myself, to, to move through this, to have that. But then, but then that comes back to belief. Like I can't just say, you should just believe in yourself and you'll get through it. Sometimes it's easier to believe in yourself when someone else believes in you first. Earlier I shared that, you know, there's a lot of people who are patient with me. There was a lot of help I received as well along the way. Like in the beginning, when I first moved to this province, I didn't have anything. I didn't have a coat. I didn't have a place to live. And my friend Clint, man, the amount of he helped me find a place to live. He got me a winter coat. He helped get me set up this amazing job. Holy crap. I failed the interview and he was able to help me. This is where, you know, like I am ever thankful for the opportunities I have. And I'm blessed with the opportunity to be here with you guys today. Before I finish up, I wanted to say thank you. You guys mean a lot to me. Your messages mean a lot to me. I hear every week about something. Let me know what you guys think about this, this topic of resilience. I really appreciate you guys hanging out, spending a little bit of your Saturday night here, but I want to take care, say goodbye. Have fun, everybody. Bye.